Okay, so what I want to talk about today is a little bit about just kind of, I'm going to start off a little bit of wildfire science background and so from some material that I take from my classes. Uh, so I teach two classes, San Jose State, in uh, one in wildfire science for general education and uh, advanced fire meteorology. And so I really want to focus on how we monitor the wildfire environment, but from a meteorological perspective, you know, collecting observate wildfire and meteorology observations at the fire front. Okay. And so I'll give you a little motivation after uh, I give you some background and then I'll talk about some small scale field experiments. And then I wanna talk about uh, a field campaign called RADFIRE, the Rapid Deployments to Wildfire campaign and, and highlight some new mobile assets that we have deployed to, to wildfires. And particularly talk about some mobile KA band, mobile uh, or radar deployments, which is a, the only mobile radar in the Western US. And then I'll summarize. And I'm also going to highlight, which isn't listed here, some complex terrain meteorology and kind of show how that um, can drive extreme fire behavior. But first, I want to highlight uh, this new wildfire center that we just started well, not even a year ago in September, where I hired five tenure track faculty in wildfire science. And so the idea is that we'll be able to bring an interdisciplinary group of scientists under one roof, although we're all you know, remote right now, but as we get back onto campus in the next year or so, we'll have this great group of scientists that have joined me at San Jose State, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear from them in the future. And so when we think about the fire environment, uh, we, we often have to consider uh, this science as very interdisciplinary because as a meteorologist, you know, I have to deal with plants, I have to deal with topography, I have to deal with atmospheric chemistry. And so when we think about this fire environment triangle or the fire behavior triangle, it's the combination of fuels, what's burning, the landscape, the topography, and the weather. And it's the weather that's the most uh, variable. So a little bit background, uh, what starts most wildfires? Uh, I'm sure you're thinking, well, it's got to be lightning or utilities. Well, it's basically people. And it's 88% in the US are, is human cost. So what fires are basically human cost. And we do have natural ignitions. If you think back to 2020 last year, where we had the that lightning siege and that storm move through, or we had thousands of lightning strikes starting lots of fires. Well, that's one event, but that doesn't happen all the time. So it's not as common in, in California as you would think. And so lightning is an important process, but we have to think about what humans are doing. You know, we are starting lots of fires because we're living in places where fires are easily ignited. If we think about wildfire around the world, this is a uh, global active fire detections from satellite. We can see that beside, outside of the Arctic in the hyper arid regions, it's fires everywhere. And so uh, looking at California, you can easily see California, uh, the Western US here, all the way through Central America, South America, and Australia, all around the world. So fire, wildfire is a common phenomenon and it helps drive our ecosystems. And so it's actually a needed process in many fire prone areas or fire dependent ecosystems, particularly in California. So we think about fire weather and something that you might've seen on the media, the red flag warning. And so when we think about fire weather, that's really just hot, dry, windy weather. And so as a meteorologist, that's kind of actually boring. Most meteorologists wanna be studying tornadoes or hurricanes or heavy rain and and thunderstorms. And so a lot of students that study uh, meteorology in California, they want to go to the Midwest to chase severe weather. But now we actually in California have severe weather as well. And we call that fire weather. And as you know, it's becoming worse and worse in terms of the impacts on society. So these conditions are summed up with the National Weather Service red flag warning. And and that's just a, a, a warning that if conditions are imminent or ongoing and these conditions are basically given in a matrix, it's humidity versus wind speed. So low humidity, high wind speed, that can be a, a red flag warning. And so this allows fire managers and society and communities to understand what weather impacts they can expect. 
But what's the difference between fire weather and fire danger? So fire danger is a description of the factors that affect the ignition, the spread, and the ease of controlling a wildfire in an area. And if you've ever gone to a state park or, or a national park or the forest, you've probably seen these smoky bear signs where it tells you uh, where's the fire, you know, what the fire danger is today. And so how do we determine that sign? If it's very high extreme, low, moderate, that is what we call the National Fire Danger Rating System. So it's a complex set of equations that takes weather station data, surface weather station, that's what these triangles are. And, and this gives us a sense of what the danger is or the risk would be another way to frame that on any particular day or sometimes even any particular hour. And so here's a map, this is from uh, 2019. You can see that we had pretty low fire danger in 2019 around the state, parts of the state, but then there are some centers with high fire danger. And so what the danger rating system is, or what we call NFDRS, or just kind of the abbreviation, uh, weather data inputs, takes fuels data, like what's the moisture, what's the fuel class, the site information, the topography, and it's designed to provide information on day-to-day -day fire operations, so closing of parks, closure of parks, uh, calculating expected fire behavior so fire management can actually deal with where they need to stage resources. So a lot of times if you're driving up the I-5 in California, you'll see a number of CAL FIRE engines driving either one way or the other. Well, they're being staged for fire weather conditions or high fire danger in the coming days. So they'll be staged either Northern California, Central or Southern. And so that's what's happening a lot of the times when you see when there's no fires happening, but you see lots of fire engines going somewhere. Uh, live fuel moisture content, you might have seen the media recently. We, we sample uh, fuels around the Bay Area or in the Santa Cruz Mountains and many agencies sample fuels. And this is where we go and manually, manually sample. And here's 2019. These are the amount of moisture inside the plant. And so we, we, we clip it, we dry it, we weigh it, then we dry it and we weigh it again and we get a, a moisture content. And so you can see 2019, the moisture values are above average, which is the green dash line and 2019 is the blue. But this year we are well below average and we were at below the minimum ever recorded for one of our sites. So because of the drought, our fuel moistures are having an impact. And this is really, impacting fire danger. And that's what the media is talking about. What are we going to have this spring? And because of these low fuel moistures and because of the drought, we can expect probably an earlier fire season and maybe a worse fire season than we would typically have. Okay, so that's all kind of the fire danger, fire weather. But what about fire behavior and fire modeling? And so really when we think of fire behavior, the typical uh, Typical um, parameter is rate of spread. And you can see here that there's no one, one size fits all rate of spread model. So this is wind speed on the horizontal axis and rate of spread on the vertical axis. And Andrew Sullivan uh, published this graph in 2009 showing that like, well, what are we gonna do? Is there a general model that we can use or do we have to apply a different model for every, every type of landscape, every type of shrub, every type of grass? And so, we really don't have uh, a good fire prediction model. That one part of that, which I'll talk about later, is that we need to couple fire spread with the atmosphere and weather model. And I'll talk about some of the modeling aspects that we do. Um, and, and particularly, if we think about the car fire tornado, I don't know if any of you saw these photos, but these are pictures that I took. I was able to go up and survey this site with the US Forest Service. This picture of the gas line wrapped around the tree and you see the bark removed from the tree that was pretty, that went viral on, on, on the social media. And this was the uh, largest fire tornado ever recorded in the US. It's a Hans Fujita scale three. Uh, you know, we're talking winds above 150 miles an hour. And if we think about this scenario, we don't really have a good understanding of how the dynamics of how wildfires create their own weather. So if we look at those basic fire spread models that I showed you earlier, which is, you know, they're sometimes mostly empirically derived through statistical models and regression. You can't, you can't forecast this type of fire behavior with those types of models. And so there is some 
theoretical background in terms of this idea from what we call the Byron number or the convective fluid number where we can take the wind speed, what's the ambient wind speed versus how much heat the fire is giving off. And so you'll see, you'll hear about, maybe you've heard about this in the media where we have plume driven fires where it's actually the heat of the fire that's driving the dynamics of the, of the fire front. Or if it's wind driven, which a lot of our fires are, where the wind is actually more powerful than the heat of the fire. And so that's this relationship. And it's a typical uh, fruit number, just a dimensionless uh, number that we can actually maybe play with. Not a, it's not a forecasting number. But anyway, so this kind of gives an idea of how we want to think about coupling the heat of the fire and wind speed. And so if I, with this background, I want to talk to you today about observations. How do we observe the meteorology around wildfires? And we, we take an approach similar to storm chasers for understanding tornado dynamics. And the issue is that we have very few meteorological observations near active wildfires. And that's, you know, we have lots of weather stations now in the utilities, pg and &E, San Diego Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, they've spent millions of dollars on enhancing surface weather station networks. So anywhere you drive around the mountains and there's a power line, you will see an anemometer and a temperature sensor. So we're getting better surface data, but we don't have a lot of the, uh, the, the higher resolution data that we need. So this has kind of given us a problem in terms that we are limited on understanding how plume dynamics affect fire spread because we don't have observations of plumes. And we have a data gap for testing the next generation coupled fire atmosphere models, which I'll explain a little bit. So my goals are to better understand the role fire atmosphere interactions have on fire behavior. Like how does the fire couple? How is it driving the wind? And to do that, I'm purely coming from an uh, experimental or, or observational standpoint. So I'm collecting observations in both planned small scale experimental fires and in large active wildfires. So those are the two data sets I'll be uh, sharing with you today and some of the technologies that we have. And so let's look at this uh, Fireflux 2 experiment. So this is the same plot I did my PhD in, uh, experiment in, in 2005, 2006. And we went back in 2013 and conducted a similar experiment where we actually ignited a fire. Hopefully this video is playing and then I'll explain this animation on the right. I'm just kind of, let me, it's gonna take a while to get through here. So, so we have an ignition, we have a fire crew igniting this fire. And the unique thing about this fire experiment, it was conducted under red flag warning and the state of Texas had a fire ban on this day. So we came in and we were able to get this fire off the ground. And so uh, you're looking down at the tower, there's a 45, 42 meter tower, sorry, 43 meter tower right here. And now you're seeing the head fire move through the instrumentation array. Um, and, you know, it moves very rapidly. You can't really outrun this fire. It was spreading about three meters per second. So, you know, six to 10 miles an hour. And now it's burning directly through this tower where we have 3D sonic anemometers to measure turbulence and three-dimensional winds, high resolution, temporal resolution, temperature sensors, uh, thermocouples that are able to measure the plume structure. And you can see it just kind of moves right through that instrumentation array. And so let's look at let's look at this plot here that's animated. These X's indicate anemometers or wind sensors. The arrows indicate the vector wind. So we've got north northwesterly winds, and they're bouncing around in term in terms of their magnitude. This shading is also wind speed from a Doppler LiDAR, which I'll explain. It's a laser-based wind radar. And so we're scanning horizontally across the plot. And if I bring you back to this image, this tower, this X here is the tower that we're looking down from with this camera. And that's located right here. And so there's a lot going on in this figure. These black dots are soil sensors that allow us to measure the temperature so we can indicate where the fire front is. And that is actually indicated when, this, when the circle gets big, that means it's hot. We also have another contour, shaded contour in here, which is atmospheric pressure, which I want to talk about in just a bit. And so what we're seeing, and I'll let this loop in again, is that we're seeing that there's a lot of dynamics and wind flow around this uh, um, fire as it moves through the instrumentation array. We also had a helicopter filming with infrared imagery 
but it, it would get a little complicated if we overlaid that with this. So we're just using this right now. But so now you can see where it's hot. So there's the fire. You see sh blue shading, darker blue around that fire. So we can see that the pressure drops at the fire front. And what that's doing is it's accelerating the winds through the fire front. And so it, the winds aren't, the winds, these are fire induced winds and they're not, um, they're highly variable around that fire. And so let's look at this time height. So this is altitude in meters. So up to 40 meters of the tower height. We have time. And then this other panel down here is the perturbation pressure. And so you have these vector arrows. Again, these are, there's a sensor here on this tower and there's three heights, one at 20, one at 10, and one at six. The 42 meter uh, failed, so we couldn't collect data there. And you see these northwesterly winds, but you see acceleration and a slight shift as that fire front approaches. We call this fire front passage, we're indicating it here. This temperature, the shading is actually air temperature, or plume temperature, so that's the temperature of the smoke. And you see the highest temperatures right down here. So what that shows is that we don't get really high temperatures in these plumes. And I'll show you some examples of some plumes that went to you know, 30,000 feet above the ground where we were able to fly aircraft and get temperature. But these little grass fire plumes are, allow us to really isolate some of these structures because we can put sensors in these plots and we're not gonna melt them too, too bad. Another thing is that the low pressure, the, the max, or the minimum pressure occurs right ahead of the fire front and that's what's accelerating the winds. So with these field experiments, these small scale field experiments, we've been able to document uh, the advection of combustion gases ahead of the fire front, which cause the ignition of fuels. The winds accelerate through the fire front due to the dynamic pressure perturbation. And so we were able to measure that in this, in this field study. We also have a project in New Zealand where we're doing similar studies in different types of fuels. And, we take this graphic up here, which was uh, published in the um, PNAS uh, by Mark Finney et al. And you can see the structures from laboratory experiments where they've got this peak and trough in the flame front. So you have flame, you know, buoyancy driven flames going up and then you have down drafts and cooler air moving downward and pushing the flame structures through the fuels. And so these experiments were designed to kind of illustrate or to measure that phenomena. So it's a, it's a prescribed fire where it's experimental prescribed fire, but this is cut stubble. And here's what it looks like from the camera in the ground. And then you see this thermocouple array. So those are temperature sensors that are able to measure when the flames are actually hitting the fuel bed. And you can see the flames move very quickly through this fuel. And we can also use uh, overhead not really nadir, but kind of oblique um, infrared imagery. And you can see that the hottest gases, which are the reds, remain very close to the surface. And they're being pushed laterally across that fuel bed from the wind. So these flames are tilted downward towards the fuels. And so, you know, the hottest gases remain close to the surface. We have the ignition. And so we're trying to understand these very micro scale processes in the field. So taking it from numerical com computer simulations to the laboratory, simul or laboratory experiments and into the field. And then eventually uh, moving up in the, uh, in the uh, scale with wildfire. So let me just kind of stop that. Okay, so I want to jump into fire behavior in canyons. So I showed you some experiments in uh, flat terrain, which is very idealized. But here in California, we don't have a lot of fires that are in flat terrain. I mean, I would, I would say that we have zero fires because the flattest terrain in California is agricultural land and maybe the, the vineyards, and we really don't get fire spread or, or extreme fire behavior in those landscapes. It's usually in steep terrain. And one issue, is the fact that we have canyons and canyons are very special in terms of fire behavior. And a term called eruptive fire behavior, fire eruption was uh, coined by uh, Dominguez Viegas, who runs a very uh, uh, large fire research team in Portugal in Coimbra. And he proposed this term because it was similar to volcanic eruptions. And it's also a term that's known as blow up uh, fire behavior. And so fires on steep slopes and particularly in canyons have this behavior where the rate of spread increases continuously producing a fire eruption. And it's not rare in canyons. So it's not this out of the blue kind of thing that will happen 
every so often, it happens all the time. And fatalities from wildfires and canyons are common because of this phenomenon. And Viegas and uh, Albert Simeone uh, did a nice paper review, uh, review paper on, on accidents. And I just wanna take your attention to the Pulaska fire in Corsica. I was able to visit Corsica for part of my sabbatical in 2014. And here you can see this canyon, the beach is right here off the, off the right. And this canyon bends up and this looks like California. I mean, this could be Santa Barbara. I mean, it's the same ecosystem. It's shrublands, it's a Mediterranean climate, obviously. And so this island in the middle of Mediterranean has the same kind of street features that we have in California you know, where we have this tall brush. This is a plaque where uh, indicates where those firefighters were overrun by fire eruption. And uh, there's a memorial at the bottom of the, of the, at the beach at the bottom of the canyon. So this case uh, really shows the, you know, the devastating effects of what fires can do because they race so quickly up a canyon sidewall. And so what uh, Viegas did to study this phenomenon, he's been doing this for quite some time and base, our basic knowledge of fire behavior in canyon topography is, comes from his laboratory experiments. And you can see that you can, he's, he's got this huge lab where you can build these uh, kind of configured different geometries. So like this would be a V-shaped canyon that's tilted upward. And he's got different fuel loadings and stuff. But what, you, what I wanna point out is that you have this fire and it burns straight up the canyon, up the drainage at the bottom of the V here. But then all of a sudden you're gonna see this fire exploding up the sidewalls. So you can see it expanding laterally up the sidewalls of the canyon. And that's what gives you this extreme area growth. And this is why canyons are so dangerous because if we plot the time series of fire area growth, you can see that, you know, it's not growing very much at the bottom of the canyon. It's just chugging along, not gaining much area. So the fire's not spreading an area very fast. And then all of a sudden it becomes exponential and explosive. And that's because of the sidewalls are burning. And so that's a problem. And so we kind of look at, you know, force, forcing mechanisms on slopes. And, you know, here's kind of a conceptual model that I, I've drawn here. Um, so we have a tilted flame front and we have a slope of some sort of some angle. And it turns out that angles of about 24 degrees uh, allow for what's called flame attachment. It's where the flames just attach to the wall or to the slope itself. And that's because if we had a campfire, and I don't have that figure up, but if we had a campfire, you know, the campfires generally stand up vertically. If you take this vertically standing flame and you tilt it, tilt it up on a sidewall or up on a slope, as indicated in this uh, diagram, you're limiting the entrainment from the upper up, so, up the up the uphill side here, and so you're forcing wind from the back side only, and so that tilts the flame. So you get a slope-driven fire spread. So enhanced convection and radiation and flame contact really helps drive the the uh, contact of the flame front onto the fuels, and so that's part of the mechanisms that cause this ex exponential uh, fire area growth. So we tried to do some fire experiments in canyons and gullies, and I'll show you a couple of these. These are sped up a few times. And so we have a meteorological tower. We have a portable meteorological tower. This is, what is it, 32 meters, so about 106 feet. And we have a 12 meter tower located in the middle of this slope here. And then we we're trying to get the fire to go up this gully. And so let's see here, here we go. There's a the firefighter, it's sped up, he's igniting it. And what you're seeing is that it's not going up the gully, it's not going up the slope because it's only about like eight degrees, 10 degrees here. And so firefighter comes around and he relights it. And I'll show you some interesting micrometeorological aspects of this, but so he's lighting it from the other side and okay, a little more intensity. And now this plume is starting to stand up a little more heat. So here we go back to the Byron's number where you have more heat. So the wind isn't driving it. Now you can see some indrafts where the wind, the smoke is coming back into the fire here. And now the plume is standing straight up. So we have a fire and do circulation here. And then it kind of peters out and just kind of stops doing anything. So if we uh, 
look at this a little more. And now you'll see what we had to do. We had to do a mass ignition in the, in, the, in the gully here and you'll see some flares. So he's shooting flares into the gully and starting these spot fires. And this is what how a lot, most wildfires spread. They spread by spot fires. So we really need to start doing experiments where we just have multiple spot fires. And we can do it with flares or we can do it with ping pong balls out of a helicopter or, or even some sort of predetermined array. But now what you're seeing is you're seeing the fire begin increasing in intensity. These, all these spot fires merged and now the fire is getting a little, now it's a head fire burning up the canyon with the wind. So now you have wind alignment more so that, so because it's more exposed to the ambient wind, it's probably driven by the wind versus any kind of uh, flame attachment. This was a 20 degree slope, 22 degree slope. So we're below that flame attachment um, criteria from the laboratory studies. Anyway, so we try to do these experiments and they're, they're okay, um, but it's, it's hard to do this type of work in the field. It's easier to do it numerically. Here's another view. You know, so this is a one second time-lapse camera. And so there, you know, that fire kind of moved around. Unfortunately, this fire is going to keep burning. Uh, this is going to keep uh, looping here. But I want to bring your attention over to these plots here. We had the Doppler LiDAR scanning vertically. And so what you see is smoke. So this is backscatter intensity from the LiDAR. So again, it's like a radar, but it uses an infrared laser beam. And you can see that plume structure and then you can see it kind of detach here and, and get some entrainment. Below here, these panels are the uh, winds. And this little arrow indicates that we have the strongest winds occurring right at this time, with reds being away from the LIDAR and blues being towards. If we go to the next panel, E here, you can see that we have a circulation forming where we have this overturning of the plume. Let me just kind of click it there, overturning of the plume. And that continues through the next panel here, the next scan. What that overturning plume actually does is it brings hot air downward to the surface. And so we're getting negative sensible heat flux. And so this is basically kilowatts per meter squared. So we're getting lots of heating or hot air moving to the surface. Now this could have implications for some fire behavior in terms of it's hot enough, or maybe it's bringing embers downward, maybe it's increasing the spread but these downdrafts actually can help spread the fire. And it's likely related to some of these structures that have been observed in the laboratory. Okay, so these are kind of the micrometeorological structures that we can observe in the field with these experiments, both in flat terrain and in um, complex terrain. And the, this burn occurred in central California. Okay, so what about sampling large wildfires? So this is what I wanna talk about for the rest of the uh, program is, the rapid deployments to wildfires experiment. And so we had um, a program funded by NSF where we basically had a, a, the LIDAR, we mounted it in, on an airbag frame in the back of this truck, which is our typical field truck. And we take it out to wildfires. And the idea is that we wanna do rapid response deployments so we can collect data on active wildfires. And, and the idea is that we get field observations from the fire front, which are really hard to get. All the team members are red carded. So we have firefighter two qualifications and we're sponsored through the Tahoe National Forest. Um, we're available through the National Resource Ordering Status System so we can be requested to an incident. And we provide data to the incident meteorologist or IMET and the fire behavior analyst or FBAN. And so we can provide vertical wind profiles. We launch weather balloons. Our truck is outfitted with a upper air sounding system and, and helium tanks. And so we can collect a lot of data that you, know, you just don't get from a weather station network. And this is a deployment, it's kind of windy. This is the Kincaid fire. We have winds gusting over 50 miles an hour here. That's the radar, which I'll talk about. And so this is a group of students that are scraping the grasses away from the truck because we don't want a spot fire to burn underneath the truck. So that's kind of what we're doing. And we ended up leaving this site before we had to really worry about spot fires. And so what can we measure? So that I'm going to talk about the radar in just a little bit, but before I want to talk about the Doppler LiDAR. And again, this is a laser-based radar. Uh, they basically sample 
It's Doppler so we can actually measure the along beam velocity field. And if we scan it a certain way and do a certain pattern, we can get vertical velocities uh, above the LIDAR. We can get horizontal velocities around the region. But we also, the, the laser is sensitive to smoke particles. And so what you're seeing here are different scans. And you're seeing the top of the plume punching through this stable layer. So all the smoke's trapped here. This is the free atmosphere. This is just backscattered noise. And so you can see the structure of the plume really, really well. And we're out two kilometers from where the LIDAR is located. And so we can get these structures. And that's really important for air quality modeling, uh, understanding where uh, air and smoke is going to go. And we had a summary article in the Bolton of the American Meteorological Society, um, and we summarized our 30 wildfires that we sampled in about four years, all in California. And uh, we've been requested to go to out of state, but sometimes it's just hard to put the team together to do those types of deployments. Um, here's the kind of data we get with the LIDAR. So here's the LIDAR. It's just this white, let me get my, my mouse here. Okay, it's just this white box sitting on the back of the truck. It's got a scanning head. We can point the laser anywhere. And so what you're seeing is a fire in Yosemite National Park. This is off of Highway 120, just above Yosemite uh, Valley. And we're scanning vertically. We're slicing vertically through the plume. And what you see in the velocity structure here is that you can see the, this is the average. And this is uh, my colleague, Neil LaRoe, who, uh, was a lead author on this work. And you can see end drafts into the base of the plume from both sides. So reds are away, blues are towards. So we're getting a strong end draft, just like a campfire into the base of this wildfire. You know, it's not very strong. It's not like uh, you know, high velocities, but then we see kind of the mean vertical velocity as the plume punches vertically and then some substance and down, down drafts downwind. We also can see that the most vigorous mixing occurs along the lower edges of the plume. And this is because we have the highest smoke variance here. And so we interpret that as as strongest mixing. And then here's what it, oops, here's what it kind of looks like. I don't know if I can get this. Yeah, here we go. So if you can see this, so we're scanning. And I mean, this these are observations from the LIDAR. This looks like a numerical simulation, but that's the smoke doing its thing while we scan. It takes about 40 seconds to do a a slice through the atmosphere. And so again, we sampled about 30 fires. So we can really get some really high resolution detailed observations that we've never been able to observe before. So that was kind of the groundbreaking stuff we've done in the last five years. Uh, we deployed to the campfire on the first day. Uh, it was a very interesting day, as you can imagine. We were deployed on Pence Road on the south flank of the fire. So paradise is actually in here. Uh, the fire had already moved through the town by the time we got there. Um, and we made wind profiles. And so we actually published a paper on the meteorological conditions of the campfire. Obviously a wind-driven fire, very famous, you know, most deadly fire in California history. Um, and the fire spread was associated with long range spotting. And I don't wanna spend too much time looking at this figure, but we can measure the smoke and we can measure these, these vector arrows are the wind speeds that we measure with the with the LIDAR pointing vertically. And you can see we're right near the, the fire front and you can see active suppression activity. So we try to stay out of the way. We do not get involved or put our equipment or my students in, in the way of any fire suppression activities. We, we stay in kind of by the press actually, because the press can go anywhere. And everybody's fire alarm qualified, so we're uh, ready to go. But here's what it looked like when we ended up leaving that, that location on Pence Road. That's the LIDAR, it's pointing vertically. It's the back of the truck. And now you're seeing the embers. So these are how these fires spread. People say, well, there's a road, the fire will stop burning at the road, but you can easily see that the embers alone can cross the road quick, quite easily. And we noticed that all night long while we were there, that the fire would just, like, there's no fire there one minute and then soon, sure enough, the tree behind you is on fire. So those rapid deployments from ground-based, uh, using ground-based you know, vehicles and uh, remote sensing uh, assets like LIDAR, and I'll talk about the radar next, are, are really efficient, but we can't, it's hard to get to big fires. So we had the opportunity through our NSF grant to collect some data using the Wyoming King Air. So uh, we wanted to test the Wyoming Cloud Radar, which is a W-band um, 
uh, Doppler radar, and it's located in this pod here, so it can point down and forward and up. And what you're seeing is uh, a, a picture of the Pioneer Fire plume from, I think, 27,000 feet, or was this 24? This might have been at 24,000 feet, yep. And so they penetrated this, and they probably will never do that ever again. And I'll show you exactly why. Um, this is a photograph taken at the same time. You can't see it on your screen. I can barely see it on mine, but we found this photo and we can see the aircraft right here. So this is a pyrocumulonimbus because of its altitude being in the higher troposphere. It's at the top of the troposphere. It's very cold up there. And the aircraft altitude max is about 27,000 feet for this King Air. And so we were able to collect radar images with a down pointing Doppler radar. And these are velocities here. And so don't worry about these statistics down here, but we actually have for the first time a, a vertical velocity profile through the whole plume. This is above sea level. So 2000 meters, you know, this is in Idaho. So we're in the mountains, but these triangles here, these white triangles indicate the maximum velocity in each scan. And you're asking why there's like missing data right here. I wanna point that out. Let's go back to that photo. You can see this cleft structure where there's an indraft coming in. So the radar is scanning above. It's, uh, it's able to penetrate through this plume and it hits the bottom plume, but because it's clear here, there's no back, there's no return or reflectivity off the particles. And so that's what that's missing. But I wanna highlight that we measured extremely strong updrafts of 58 meters per second. So that's about 130 miles an hour. These are deep updrafts with the strongest velocities observed well above the ground. And so we just published this, it came out in September in 2020 as a, a graduate student of mine on geophysical research letters, extreme pyroconvective updrafts during a mega fire. And so, you know, it's just simple observations, but we had never seen this before. And what was interesting is because this aircraft has all sorts of sensors, when they did penetrate the plume on the, on the edges, and they hit a 39, 37 meter per second updraft and it was quite vigorous and very quite dangerous. And so uh, they went back up into higher altitude and did it again, but didn't get quite as large updraft. And so they did three penetrations and during those penetrations, they were able to uh, sample with some of these cloud particle imagers, pyrometeors. So we usually think about hydrometeors in clouds, but now we have a term called pyrometeors uh, uh, Nick McCarthy uh, from the University of Queensland, Australia, he coined that term after I think hearing it from Adam Pochansky at a conference, but pyrometeors are, is now the new term that we use for what radars actually see in fires. And so he, uh, Nick uh, has a nice review paper on what's going on in fire. So in terms of what processes affect pyrometeors, so ash density, smoldering ash, we have leaves, we have uh, pyrometers mixing with hydrometeors because there's cloud droplets and some of that stuff falls out that's heavier, some of it gets lofted. This is a smoldering leaf that we sent, collected from the ground from the Kincaid fire. And then here's an example of some rain droplets with a pyrometeor, some ash debris inside of it. So lots of different things. Uh, so Nick, for his PhD, deployed a, a Doppler X-band radar on a bunch of wildfires in Australia. And this uh, animation shows what a dual polarized radar can give us. Oops, sorry. Oh, I don't have the, uh, there's a missing figure here, but that's okay. So this DBZH uh, is horizontal reflectivity. So because it's dual polarized, there's a beam in the horizontal and there's a beam in the vertical. And we can actually look at the ref differential reflectivity between the two beams. So that ZDR is a difference between the horizontal and vertical reflectivity. So it gives us an idea of drop shape. So what you're seeing here is smoke on the right, on the left. And on the right hand side of this panel, you're seeing rain. We also have correlation coefficient, which is the measure of how similarly the horizontal and vertically polarized pulses are behaving within the volume. And so you can see that for rain droplets, it's up closer to one and for smoke particles, we're down about 0.3. And so these polarized radars, Doppler radars, are a really useful tool to tell us something about the pyrometeors. So this is kind of the state of the science of what people are doing. 
And so because of our work at, with the radar, um, the cloud radar on the Wyoming King Air and from Nick's work, we approached NSF and we were awarded a grant to acquire a KA band uh, cloud radar. And so we had it mounted on a, a four wheel drive pickup truck. It's got leveling jacks. We can level it in two minutes, three minutes, and we can collect volumetric scans of wildfire plumes. And so it's the only mobile radar in the Western US. And I'm gonna show you some pictures and some data from that. Um, just checking on time here. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, our first fire that we deployed to was October 9th, 2019. And it was the Bryceburg fire outside of Yosemite National Park. And you can see that this fire is pretty far away and we've got a great line of sight and this is just amazing. But what we're seeing here is we can't, you know, it's not very well defined. It's, uh, we're, four, we're 13 kilometers away and we're getting really interesting data, but it's not high resolution. And so, the takeaway points are is even at large ranges above greater than 10 kilometers, you know, our LIDAR, we can't see anything past like six kilometers really well. We still get high resolution observation of plume structures. And so what you're seeing here is um, an RHI or a vertical slice of the atmosphere through uh, reflectivity cores, this is ZH. So these reflectivity cores are large pyrometers and the brighter the color, the more reflectivity. So it's either more pyrometeors or bigger pyrometeors. And so we can see that these cores of high reflectivity propagate vertically. And so it's propagating vertically all the way through the plume and then it's kind of punching out the backside. And so it's just kind of, it's kind of hard. You got to squint your eyes, use your imagination with this figure, but there it is. So there's a nice trail of high reflectivity, and then pretty soon you'll see it kind of punching up here with higher reflectivity. Um, and I think I'm through the loop here. But anyway, so these pyrometeor cores are areas of within the plume where you have the largest uh, ash. There it is. And so it's punching up over and through and out downwind. So that structure we've never observed. We, were never, we could never observe that with the, ray, with the LIDAR. But with the, the scanning radar, we can do that. And so we deployed it to the King Fire, or sorry, the King Cave Fire, excuse me. And we, we had two locations. We had deployment one is right here uh, in Alexander Valley. And then we deployed over here, which I can't remember where this was, but I think it's Knights Valley actually. And so this is a horizontal slice through the plume. And you see the high reflectivities, which are the reds here, not very high compared to, if you're thinking about thunderstorm, we're talking, you know, 50, 60 uh, dBZ in reflectivity for rain and hail, hail being even higher than that. But for smoke in a cloud radar, KA band, this is pretty high for us. So what we can see is that we can see that the, the strongest updraft cores uh, are associated with the highest reflectivity so we can actually maybe map out where that fire front is just from the radar data. And a colleague of mine, uh, Neil Rowe at the University of Nevada, Reno, is actually doing that with um, uh, the National Weather Service radar network. And he's found some really interesting results by tracking um, high reflectivity areas with satellite detection. But you can see how high resolution this is. And we're out eight kilometers. We also can scan in the vertical. Uh, so this is uh, a vertical scan of the reflectivity. So again, this is the pyrometeor like loading, let's say how much stuff is reflecting, how much energy is reflecting off the particles. This is a velocity field. So we can see that winds are coming towards the LIDAR, which is located at zero. And then their winds are away from the LIDAR, which are the reds, you know, it's pretty strong, pretty windy day above that, or it's actually windy night. And so we can see all these interesting structures. And the idea is that maybe we can track pyrometeors and firebrands. And so that's one of the ongoing projects that we want to do is be able to collect firebrands like that leaf I showed you earlier and relate it to uh, what we're seeing in the radar reflectivities. We also had a great opportunity to go to a prescribed fire as part of what's called the uh, FASMI project. So it's the uh, fire and smoke model evaluation experiment. It's conducted in the, um, the Fish Lake National Forest. This is a satellite view of the plume. And we were able to deploy the radar about two and a half, three kilometers from the plume. This is a prescribed fire. Okay, this looks like a wildfire anywhere else, but they're trying to do high intensity burns of mixed conifer at high altitude. 
to replant it, to remove the mixed conifer and bring in more aspen, which is what should dominate this area. And what you're seeing here, really high resolution scans, observations, and you can see even the motion in the plume. You can see those high reflectivity cores propagating vertically very well. You can see overturning of the plume. We can see the velocity structures over here on the right, uh, you know, strong velocities of 28 meters per second. We also have the differential reflectivity, which we're not seeing, you know, in, in these figures here, the differential reflectivity is, is hard to determine, but we're, we're getting numbers that are more typical of, uh, of ash that have been found earlier. And then the correlation coefficients are also kind of in this 0 0.5, 0 0.4 region, but it's not as clear here. If we look at when the plume got even deeper, now we're looking at something six kilometers above uh, above the ground, which is about nine, we're at three kilometers above the ground because we're about 10,000 feet here. So we're getting into the top of the troposphere. And we can see a little bit difference in, in the correlation coefficient. And we did some averaging, I'm not gonna show that, but we can see it. Our correlation coefficients are a little bit higher than what um, McCarthy et al found. Here's what that plume did. Uh, quite a big plume, pyrocumulus uh, cloud. You can almost define it as, it's probably not a pyrocumulonimbus, uh, but it got to 30,000 feet and above. And this is taken from Southern Utah. So this radar allows us very high resolution observations that we've never been able to observe before. It can scan very quickly so we can get the evolution and the overturning of the plume and measure all sorts of different uh, dual polarized uh, products. So those are kind of the tools. Uh, I think I did a lot of different things. I'm just going to do this so I can kind of give you the summary. So small scale experiments allow us to really look at the micro scale aspects of fire spread. I did show some experiments in canyons, but I really wanted to highlight how um, extreme fire behavior occurs regularly in canyon topography. And that's because of that ex uh, explosive fire growth up the sidewalls that was shown by some of the uh, laboratory experiments by Dominguez Viegas. Uh, we also showed, uh, or I showed you today, a close range observations can be made at active wildfires. It's not easy. You have to be able to get close range. You have to have fire line qualifications. You have to have a relationship with fire management agencies. And we have a good relationship with CAL FIRE. And the fact that Doppler LIDARs and, and Doppler radars are really ideal for studying plume dynamics and allows us to see how fires can create their own wind fields and how they can um, modify the atmospheric environment in their, in their location. Uh, the CASPER, which I highlighted with our, with our radars, called the KA scanning polarized radar. The CASPER provides very high resolution dual pole observations so we can get some of those uh, you know, correlation coefficient products. And, you know, we only have a sampling of about five plumes, six plumes. So we still need to collect more data um, down the road. But let me talk a little bit about some of the modeling work that my colleague Adam Pachansi is doing at uh, San Jose State. So we have, we're operating the most advanced uh, forecasting system. It's called Warp S Fire. It's uh, a coupled fire atmosphere system. You probably may recognize this from 2020 where we had the Santa Clara unit fire complex fire. We had the Santa Cruz CZU complex fire and we had the fire down here in uh, Monterey County. And so this is the, a very large domain. It's a weather model that's coupled to a fire and chemistry model. So we can actually calculate smoke statistics, smoke impacts on communities. And we can calculate extreme fire behavior and uh, see all how the winds are changing. And so we analyze all these data and we are going to be operating this in real time this summer in coordination with a company called Technosilva, which provides CAL FIRE uh, fire behavior modeling. One other thing about the warp as fire is uh, we have a, a custom ignition for prescribed burn. So we can actually help fire managers conduct prescribed burning, which I'm sure you've heard about in uh, the media, how we, the state needs to do more prescribed fire so we can help manage that. Um, by drawing in ignition, we've got a web portal where you can click. This goes off to our HPC, High Performance Computing Center, and it runs on, you know, uh, a lot of processors or a lot of cores. And then you can see the output here where you're generating smoke. You can see the winds, you can see the actual ignition pattern in there. 
And now we can get those fire induced winds and calculate the, the impact smoke impacts on communities downwind to see what this prescribed fire would do. So that tool is really important and um, it's available now. And then future work is we, we've got the trucks, we've got the radar, the LIDAR, we've got surface weather OBS. We, we actually have a couple of papers on using drones in wildfire environment. I didn't show that today. We have a, a, a data stream of satellite infrared detections, uh, bringing in aircraft infrared detections, and then integrating that <clears throat> into a data simulation scheme that we have using machine learning. And we can really improve our forecasts and, and send this out to clients, whether it's first responders or fire managers out in the field. And so we want to improve it, situational awareness. And that's it. And I want to thank you all for paying attention and hopefully you were able to um, follow along and I didn't drop out. Thanks, Craig. Um, really appreciate you coming on and speaking with us today. I, I do think that our audience is ready for some questions. I already see the Q&A function at the bottom is starting to fill up. So I'll just kind of go ahead and start right at the, the top here. It says, um, what kinds of data exist of wildfire dynamics and what kind of measurements or data is needed to better understand the dynamics of wildfire? And then, sorry, same person says a minute question, besides LIDAR and radar data, would it be useful to get ground data, pressure, wind velocity, assuming it could be collected? Yeah, I mean, the ground data would be the surface station network. And that's, California has the highest number of surface weather stations than any other place on the planet. So we already have all those data and that's great, uh, but they're usually in a network. So they're timing, you know, we need high, res high temporal resolution. Um, I think networks of radars and LIDARs are important. Some of those things we're, we're working on, um, but yeah, I, I think in understanding wildfire dynamics, another really interesting thing that we're working with some vendors is we need airborne, real-time airborne uh, IR imagery, and we need it faster than once a day. Typically, uh, the contractors have an aircraft, they have a camera system, and they fly a fire, and they spit that out. The fire management, incident management team, they, they plot it on a map, and so every night at two in the morning, they get a new perimeter, and that perimeter is static. And that's really great for fire operations, but for fire modeling, we need a dynamic fire perimeter and we need high resolution. And most of these perimeters are saturated, so we can't actually get a lot of useful stuff. It's like, oh, it's really hot and bright, meaning saturated that the infrared sensor is saturated. So you can't tell what temperature it is. You can't tell if it's smoldering there and it's a flaming front there, if it's backing or a head fire. So we need a better sensor technology that's flown more frequently. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely it does. Uh, thank you. One thing, do you think you could either sh stop sharing your screen or go back to your PowerPoint just so we can, oh, perfect. Yeah, get to see you up close now, get to talk to you. So another thing we had, or another question we had from one of the audience members is what is the role of controlled burning in limiting the spread of wildfires? Uh, controlled burning is actually a really important process. We need to do more of it in California. That's the plan. The governor's bill is talking about implementing more dollars for prescribed burning for, for fire agencies or land management, land management agencies. And so what that does, so there's two ways. What it does is it removes fuels. So if you take the fire behavior triangle and you've got heat and you've got fuel, if you take away the one of those, you don't have the fire. So if you take away the fuel, you don't have the fire. So the idea with, you can remove the fuel mechanically, which you know, a lot of people do. You cut down the trees, remove the brush with chainsaws. And you know that's a lot of labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And you can remove it that way. But prescribed fire is actually better for the environment because it's low intensity and it removes the fuel, but keeps a lot of the, the carbon and, and, and some of the, a lot of the nutrients in the soil. So yeah, the role of controlled burning or prescribed fire and limiting the spread of fires is, is, is high, it's important. Mm -hmm. You will still have fire burning through these ecosystems, but it will not burn as intense. And that's the mm -hmm. problem we're having. We're actually having such intense wildfires because of drought and, and beetle kill and um, a lot of different things, climate change mainly. And these, these fires are getting so intense that their heat output is destroying 
the vegetation and, and forests. So then we're potentially changing the forest to some other ecosystem type. So we're bringing in a different vegetation type. So that's why prescribed fire is probably better. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I remember seeing the first controlled fire on the freeway. I was like, that's just, they just do it just kind of right there off the side of the road. And it's like, okay, we understand, you know, trying to prevent those fires from being much worse. Um, so thank you for that. Another question we had, it says, is this data used to learn to predict fire behavior in order to know where to evacuate residents or to know how firefighters should handle fighting fires in different types of modeled environments? The, the data are used for both um, model prediction or prediction system validation. So we don't, you know, we can model the fires. I showed you, I showed you all those, those fires that we model, Yeah. but we don't have the uh, data to see if those models are right. So that's mm -hmm. one reason. Another reason is we're collecting data on wildfire, collecting data on wildfires because we need to observe the fires with these tools so we understand what's inside them. You know, we've never been able to look inside a wildfire before. And these are the first images of inside wildfire. So that gives us an idea of how strong the updraft velocity is because if you know that, and if your model's getting that wrong, then you're not gonna put the smoke in the right, the smoke's not gonna go high enough, let's say, Mm -hmm. And it's not going to get transported far enough, or it's going to get lofted too high. And it's going to, your, for, your smoke behavior, your smoke forecast to say, oh, you know, uh, San Francisco shouldn't be smoked out today because my model says the smoke's going to go, you know, somewhere else. Yeah. And in fact, it's actually going to impact San Francisco. So we have to constrain the models with observation. Interesting. Okay. Great answer. Um, another question for you here says, Great presentation and visuals, excellent diagrams, photographs, and videos. And then it follows up with, are university meteorology and fire weather programs growing with student interest or lacking? It's growing with student interest. We had the most applicants in the fire weather program that we've ever had this year. Wow. And we're the only, I mean, you can do fire weather at a couple of universities, but not really, there's no specific programs uh, yeah. outside of ours. It's like maybe occasional class, but we teach fire weather all the time and we have a wildfire. We actually now have a wildfire minor at San Jose State. I think it's the first wow. minor in the US. Yeah, I mean, makes sense. We're here in California, we're experiencing fires and now I feel like the interest is just there because we're it's racking our communities, you know? So yeah. people want to help prevent that in the future. It's awesome, good to hear that. Um, another question here says, are there any man-made solutions to increasing the moisture content in plants? Oof, I don't know. Um, you know, somebody commented on a talk show, I was on a talk show last week about this and someone asked about or suggested mulch, but you know, ecosystems and forests, they have their natural mulch with the duff layer. So mm -hmm. how do we do that? The best way to, to, and I don't know, cause I'm not an ecologist, but the best way is to have more rain <laughs> yeah <laughs> and higher soil moisture but you could potentially cover the ground and increase the you know that might help increase the soil moisture for some of these plants but mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a tough one yeah i don't know about man-made solutions mm -hmm. i mean yeah naturally we definitely need rain that's just like a bottom line right now um I, another question for you says what wildfire trend is most concerning to you right now and so thank you to your call to you and your colleagues for your incredible research thank you uh i'm more i'm really concerned about this drought i, yeah. I know I saw the, the the press lately but they really jumped on one of our figures which i showed you earlier on mm -hmm. the fuel moistures the fuel moistures will come up a little bit higher, but they're low and the plants are gonna have a hard time recovering. I was talking to a leading fire ecologist uh, just the other day about some of our observations. And he said that the fact that you didn't see new growth on April 1st in some of your sites is really a telling sign. These plants, they will have new growth because they already are, we, we saw it last week. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be enough. And they're not gonna be able, that new growth is not gonna be able to establish because it's gonna get too hot by the time that that growth gets big enough. So I think the, what we're seeing with the trends right now and it's climate change related is a drier atmosphere, mm -hmm. lower soil moistures, and then resulting in lower fuel moistures. And the thing is that we need better fuel moisture models for the fire danger rating system so we can predict it better and we can predict yeah. the fire spread better. So we have ongoing projects uh, to do that as well. But that's one of the trends I'm, I mean, I, you know, in California, what do we want to do? We want 
nice, beautiful summer. Mm -hmm. And then we want a rainy winter. So our rivers fill up, our reservoirs fill up and we can go skiing. Yeah. And every winter it's like, do I buy a ski pass or not? And every time I buy a ski pass, there's a drought. So that, <laughs> that's my forecasting tool. And I already forecasted the drought this year because I bought a ski pass. And that's always a joke, but unfortunately it, it came true. And I'm, it's, mm. it's kind of telling. It's, it's, I think if we, if we can get out of these droughts, if these droughts get longer and more severe, like today it was just released uh, or yesterday, April 20th, the, the U.S. drought monitor, three quarters of the state are in a severe drought. So it's, it's severe and it's going to be worse. And that's, that's April. Yeah. Usually we get into the, you know, severe drought, like in August. Yeah. We're yeah. already, it's April. We're in a huge drought. Wait till July and see what that, anyway, sorry. It's concerning, but yeah, I mean, this is stuff we can't just bury our heads in the sand. We have to take this seriously. And it's good that the research you're doing will help us, you know, plan for this in the future. Um, another, another question here from the audience says, how do you ensure the safety of yourself and your team of students when conducting these types of field experiments? So there's two, two aspects to that. So one is all students are fireline qualified. So they go through a 40 hour online course. They take a course and they pass it and they learn the instant command system. <clears throat> and then they take a one day field class where they learn how to use equipment, how to use their safety equipment and their PPE. Mm -hmm. And then they're all equipped and we go, when we go to fires, we tie into the incident. So we're not out just like Ramboing it or, you know, out and just doing our own thing. Sometimes yeah. we show up and we're, we can be far away, but we are never, well, we never want to be in a dangerous situation. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, we just, it, you know, the data are not worth in particularly my issue is I never want the radar to block a fire engine. I, you yeah. know, it's, we always, if we can't find a place to scan from, that's both safe for, for my team, safe for uh, first responders that were not in the way. And that we, you know, if we can't find, if we don't have a good escape route and all that, then we're not going to go, we'll just turn yeah. around, and go yeah. to Starbucks and figure it out. But <laughs> yeah, we can, with the radar now, we can be farther away. So that's a good thing. It's the lighter. Yeah. We had to be, you know, pretty close. The radar, we can be, you know, a few miles away, and that's usually pretty safe. But yeah. it's the firefighter safety. Now, the field experiments, we don't light the fire. Like San Jose, mm -hmm. San Jose State does not put fire on the ground. We're not. Yeah. We, we are not legally allowed to do that. Yeah. Uh, when we do the experiment in Texas, it was the Texas Forest Service. They put fire on the ground. What do we do? We stand back and we just watch it. We set up our instruments and like they say, is everybody ready? And we can know where everybody is and we light it. So what we do is we have a, like there's hierarchy. We use an instant command team. We use an instant command, incident command system. And we have a, generally some of these larger field sources may have 40 scientists and we have a discipline lead and we have a scientific um, uh, lead person who is a fire manager and they manage all the firefighters and we all have communication. So we all have radios. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a whole protocol that we follow and you can't get on a prescribed fire experiment without being understanding that protocol and having mm -hmm. the qualifications. Yeah. And a lot of times, even if you have the qualifications, you have to have a chaperone. So you have to have a firefighter with you. Mm -hmm. uh, when we go to the fires, we generally tie in, we get our radio cloned. And so we can have communications with the incident and we can follow along. This summer, however, we are gonna have tactical software provided by our uh, collaborator, Technosilva, who provides the tactical software for CAL FIRE. So we're gonna be able to watch the incident unfold and have all the information uh, that wow. uh, will keep my team safe. And that way we'll know like, oh shoot, looks like that road's closed now. It looks like we can't go over there. So maybe we gotta do this, do that. So we're looking forward to having uh, a better uh, situational awareness. Nice. No, that makes a lot of sense. Definitely safety is number one priority, especially in these dangerous situations. So that's great. Uh, along those lines, it says, would your tools be able to prescribe the best areas and best times for controlled burning or have they been used for such purposes? Yeah, so that modeling um, simulation I showed you where we could draw the simulation or draw the fire, the ignition line mm -hmm. that can totally because you can we're forecasting the weather high resolution which is with the wharf model which is the weather research forecasting model out of the uh, national center for atmospheric research so we're using a 
community national model at high resolution. And so it's, you know, the state of the science, state of the art, and that allows us to forecast, we can forecast tomorrow, the next day, five days, like what that prescribed fire is going to do. So yeah, those tools are. Another thing is that the Doppler LIDAR and radar can track the plume so we can mm. you know, understand what's happening. So we've done that. We've taken the LIDAR on the prescribed fires. We track the, and it allows us to give us upper level winds so we can measure the winds above the ground, which is actually more important than surface winds, believe it or not, because it turns out those upper level winds actually mix to the surface. And that's what your that's what your wind gust is, right? So if you're yeah. walking along and you feel the wind gust, that's what we call higher momentum a lot being mixed to the surface. And it just kind of is a turbulent gust. And so with the LIDAR, we can measure the whole profile in the atmosphere. And having that profile of wind speed is really important for the onset of downslope windstorms like Diablos or Santa Ana's and uh, for prescribed fires. So yeah, these tools are used, both the numerical and the observational tools. Nice. Um, another question here says, uh, studying fire dynamics scale is important. How are small scale laboratory experiments emulating real processes taking place in the large scale? That's a great question. That's something that we're trying to answer exactly that. So we need to collect more, uh, field scale observations. And we, we've, uh, the paper by Finney et al showed that these, uh, trough and tower structures and the flame fronts are scaling to the field and scaling to larger fuels. Um, but we still don't have, a, in, in some preliminary research that I saw from, you know, we, we hosted the fire weather research workshop two weeks ago at San Jose State online. We had 400 uh, attendees. And uh, one of the presentations showed that some of the things that we see in small grass fires were seen on very large wildfires in terms of the wind mm -hmm. structure. So that's, that's encouraging. So uh, to answer your question, it appears that it scales from the laboratory to the full wildfire scale. Great. Um, another question from the same person says, drier conditions facilitate fire, but at the same time, the same conditions slow down the growth of fresh fuel. Does somebody consider these two processes developing in time together? Uh, so the, the drier conditions, uh, the drought limits the, the grass crop and you have a, a lower grass yield. So you will have lower intensity. So fire intensity and spread rate is a function of fuel loading, which is how much stuff is there to mass to burn. And also, also you know, humidity and, and temperature. So when these fuels cure, that's when they can burn. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we could expect some grass, the grass fires to be slightly less intense because some areas probably have a lower grass yield because of the drought, but you will still carry fire through the grass fuels and you will carry that fire into the shrub and forest where the fuels are dry. And that's where we get our, have our big problems. Interesting. Okay. And maybe this is kind of the last question. It's a great one to end on. It says, what are some areas of California that are most vulnerable to, to wildfires this season? I, I, I would think that Southern California is going to be problematic and, and Northern California. I think it's the whole state because of the drought. I think the Sierra Nevada is going to be problematic this year because we had a very low snowpack and it's drying quickly. So can't yeah. really give you that answer. Yeah, but at least you'll be able to say you warned us when it does happen. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody knows. Everybody knows yeah. that it's going to be a very difficult fire season, and we're seeing it already. April 1st, fuel moistures were our telling sign that we could be in pro we're going to have some problems. Yep. Well, thank you. I think it's time to kind of wrap up now. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this virtual Cafe Sci this evening, and thank you again, Craig, for taking the time to speak with us tonight about extreme fire behaviors um, and how you're able to measure them, how you go about doing that. It was, it was so awesome to learn about. Um, I know based on all of these questions, our attendees definitely found this fascinating as well. So thank you all for tuning in again. Um, our next Cafe Sci will be in May. So be on the lookout for the registration link and the follow-up email after this is over. And with that, have a great rest of your Thursday evening. And I look forward to seeing you all next month for our next Cafe Sci.